Good morning and welcome to another Running Tales podcast. If you don't know already, this is the podcast where we attempt to tell the extraordinary stories of everyday runners. I'm Craig Lewis and we have a treat for you today. Yes, Michelle is back. She's joined me to speak to this week's guest, Lorna Cullen. Lorna has recently returned from an epic run across the country. Despite not starting running until later in life, Lorna wanted to complete a real challenge. So decided to take on a joggle with a twist. For those who don't know, that's not some kind of exotic cocktail. The joggle is the name for running from John O'Groats to Land's End. The twist, in Lorna's case, is that she decided to take in three important peaks along the way. Ben Nevis, Scarfell Peak and Snowdon. She did it all to raise money and awareness for two fantastic charities, the Menopause Charity and Mind, the Mental Health Charity. I started our chat by asking Lorna what made her decide to take on such an epic journey. That's a good question. (laughs) And one quite a few people asked me whilst I was doing it. It was sort of not something that happened. It wasn't a decision that happened overnight. It was over a period of time. I think I started running in my 40s, really because I was struggling with mental health at the time. And I really found out that if I ran sort of four or five days a week, that I could really manage that without sort of the need for medication or anything like that. And yeah, really, then I joined a running group, started doing the 5Ks, the 10Ks, you know, that sort of thing. Started buying running magazines. And um, I got to the point where it wasn't quite enough. I wanted to do something more exciting. And I found myself uh, sort of cutting out things out of magazines that were ultras all over the world and things like that. And sort of dreaming and putting them on a pin. I even had a dream pin board. Yeah, I just got to the point where I, I wanted to do something bigger. And then I realised one day I really wanted to do something by myself rather than for a sort of organised event. And from there, I started to think, I want to run from John O'Groats to Land's End. Started looking into it, reading up on it. Initially, I was just going to do the straightforward, if you can call it straightforward route. But two years before I actually started do, started the run, I found out that they'd started a race to do juggle and I kind of thought well I want I want mine to be different so that's when I came up with the idea of running via the three mountains in Scotland England and Wales and yeah so I'm I'm, I made decided to make it unique and so yeah it wasn't a decision overnight it was sort of over a, a period of time if you will yeah, that was going to be one of the questions I asked you why you'd gone for a, a, a juggle on your own rather than the um rather than the actual event. But I think you've you probably um ticked that one off. But for, for people listening, are you able to just give us the, the numbers that make up a run like that? Because I think they're pretty impressive. The juggle that I did ended up being somewhere shy of 1900 um kilometers. I think that's like 1200 miles or something where your normal juggle is probably around 900 miles, let's say. It's 20,000 metres plus ascent. And I did it over 49, 49 and a half days. If I'm completely honest, I probably could have finished it a few days earlier, but I'd arranged to meet my husband at the finishing line. And he was um, quite emphatic I should not get there a day or two <laughs> earlier. <laughs> and I found out why when I got there, because I had a sort of surprise with a few other people there. The extra bit of the joggle as well, um, are you able to explain to people what that was that you decided to to tack on to the end of what was already a pretty gruelling sounding run? Do you mean the, the fact that I went by the mountains? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, originally I was actually going to climb them as well. But unfortunately, I made a really bad um, trainer choice in the first week and ended up with really, really bad feet very very sore underneath and so I had to make a decision because I only had one day to climb Ben Nevis so I sort of made a decision to to not climb the mountains but I still wanted to sort of circumnavigate them so I went around the furthest point so it felt a little bit weird after that but I was absolutely determined I was still going to go via that route so yeah I went into the Lake District and round Scarfell Pike and then when I came further down through England instead of sort of carrying on I turned well it was right for me effectively and went along the Welsh coastline and 
round Wales and round Snowdon. I've seen pictures of uh, other people who've done joggle runs as well, and and the the bits that you've just described there as as the the extra bits. It, it must have been some spectacular scenery, but also quite a lot of climbs and quite a lot of hard running as well. There, yes, there were quite a lot of climbs. Actually, that's my favourite bit. Absolutely. There's a reasonable amount of uh, elevation in the West Highland Way, although I would say it's not actually very difficult. But the hilliest sections were Wales, really, really, really really hilly. There was one day where I came into a place that I can't pronounce, but it begins with M-A-C-H and ends in (laughs) T-H. And um, I went I went into um, a little shop. Uh, and I said to the, the lady there, she said, oh, where are you going? And I said, uh, um, Clandelows, very badly. She said it the, the right way, with a nice Welsh accent. And she said, oh, you'll be going up the mountain then. I said, oh, will I? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I said, oh, there is a kind of bump on the graph, but I'm on road the whole time. She says, no, it's a, it's a mountain road. And sure enough, I found myself climbing for 18 kilometres. And uh, yes, it was quite, quite, quite hilly, but um, it was, it's stunning and it's so rewarding when you do that. Um, and then Cornwall. Cornwall is incredibly hilly. Can I ask Lorna, like, how much training on hills did you do before doing this adventure? Yeah, a fair amount, actually, because we, uh, myself and my husband, live near the Peak District. Any run we do is pretty much trail and hilly. So that's kind of the norm. I mean, it's not, you know, we're not climbing mountains, but there's always a decent amount of elevation and we, you know we, we're quite lucky because we can hop on a train and go to Edale and then run back and run up over Kinder Scout and things like that so quite quite a lot of hilly training I guess. Just to uh, take a step back for, as you were going into the run you did it for two um, charities I think um, do you want to tell people why you chose those charities and, and your relationship if that's the right word with, with what they represent? I was always very clear in my mind the two charities I wanted to choose. I knew that it would be one for mental health and one for menopause. So as I mentioned before, I um, had suffered from some mental health issues in my 40s, which looking back might have been perimenopause, but I didn't really realise it at the time. My stepdaughter is also a nurse and she's also confirmed that mine do brilliant work. So I was definitely on board with wanting to donate to them and for the uh, for the menopause charity, I found I looked up you know what menopause charities are out there, and I stumbled on this charity called the Menopause Charity, and they're quite fledgling and they do brilliant work. They do um, free training for doctors, for example, and I didn't realise this that doctors are not formally trained in menopause. And I think if you speak to a lot of women in their forties and fifties about their experiences of going to the doctors and the doctors being dismissive or giving them the wrong medication or saying oh why don't you just try and eat well or something then I'll just stop you there with my own personal experience I said at the start before the podcast that I'm going through it myself recently my experience was um I was first approached by um I had to go and see a, a menopause nurse and she'd only had like an hour's course training and um, it was basically a tick wow. box on a screen and she was prepared to give me HRT there and then but because I've got other health conditions I had to say hang on a minute I'm high risk of DVT blah 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 mm-hmm. then it was like oh that's above my pay ground grade I need to put you in charge with a doctor I was told by my surgery there wasn't a female doctor because naturally I would rather speak to a doctor that's female and going through what I'm going and I'm sure many listeners are thinking this as well but I was told there wasn't a female doctor I was put through to a male doctor and when I eventually got to speak to the male doctor which was a long process in itself he wanted to put me on antidepressants and thank god I watched the Davina McCall Mm -hmm. program with Craig didn't I we watched it and so I was very quick to say no you know that's not what I need he actually said to me that he doesn't understand why we need to go on HRT wow so shocking isn't yeah it it is that is how shocking it is nowadays with menopause yeah absolutely and the thing is that you know I don't you know I'm, I'm not a doctor I can only repeat back what I've heard from the menopause charity and what I've also seen on these documentaries which is that more and more they're realising that some of the 
um, surveys that were done in the past on uh, the research that was done on HRT um, was flawed and that it's not as bad for you as you think. But also that there's a lot of, they're really starting to realise there's a lot of positive impacts from it. And then I see the way it's going will be less and less that you have to wait until you've not had a period for 12 months before you go on HRT or something. And they're going to be giving it to women earlier and earlier to actually prevent some of these problems. And they're even looking um, at the area of um, the impact on, on the brain and how it can reduce the chances of you getting dementia. So, you know, there's so much research that still needs to go into it. And that's, you know, um, another thing all these charities are, are looking at and trying to promote also awareness, training, a call centre where you can call for advice and all of these things. I know we are talking about it more and more and we have these documentaries, etc. but it's not enough yet, you know, because I still hear people say, oh, I successfully went through menopause without uh, any medication, as if that in itself is should be rewarded when really maybe they might have actually benefited more than they know. And yeah. that's frustrating. It, it makes it sound that those women who who did have to have HRT have failed, which clearly is is not the case. No, I, I'm interested. Obviously, we're the Running Tales podcast. I, I, I'm interested in how how the menopause, how perimenopause affected your running, and how you managed to get mm. to the stage you are now, where you're running from John O'Grace to Land's End. And now I'm on HRT. I don't have as many side effects as I used to so I'm able to manage you know all the things that I need to manage if you will going through well essentially it's perimenopause really but before I went on HRT yeah I mean I had hot flushes all day long um, and they made me feel sick as well so occasionally they would happen when I was running or if I was doing a, a gym class or something like that and you just had to stand still you just had to stand still because you lose your mind and the ability to think and everything for 20 seconds. So so it definitely affects you. I think also just generally hotter. So you're more likely to overheat when you're running. It can also make you more tired. So that's maybe going to affect also your motivation to run. Although ironically, of course, once you are out running, it's going to probably make you that's going to make you feel better. But getting out the door is harder. I am on HRT and it is working for me. So I don't see those side effects quite as much. Although I will say I took the HRT with me because I was um, carrying all my own kit and had to minimise all the gear I took. I dispensed my Easter gel into a tiny little pot and had to take it out with a spoon every night. And I think it went off because (laughs) in the last two weeks I was starting to have hot flushes and I was even sweating in my tent. So... Yeah, I think I think I think it's got a lifespan when you when you put it in a different pot. <laughs> it's it's interesting as well that you know we're both two women that are going through it, and we're both on. I'm on. I've been on HRT for the per, past month. I found that running and exercise stopped my hot flushes. It's mm. only when I've been injured that I started getting them, and. In the last month, um, obviously, I've not had them, but um, what I'm on the patch and the uh, tablet, I my joint pain has stopped and the pressure headaches, but the lack of sleep still um, is an issue with me, the brain fog. And mm. I, for me personally, I want your advice on like when I go out running, every run feels like an effort I understand Mm. like where you're saying once I get to two and a half three miles it kicks in and I feel like yeah I'm feeling human again but um, I always I know you know even before the first mile is always hard you've got to get your lungs warmed up and all that stuff but it's something more since going through the menopause it it feels more heavier is that something you've experienced and if you have how have you got past that I think that's difficult to answer because, I mean, I was out running today and I felt okay. But if I look at my watch, I'm a lot slower than I used to be. And you don't you don't know how much of that is just being older or, or, you know, because I felt a bit run down last week. Or is it the menopause? You don't know what's you know what the impact of that is. I probably did feel a bit heavier and slower when I first started. And um, 
But I only started running in my 40s and I think I started on the perimenopause in my 40s. So it's probably difficult for me to make that reference point to, you know, reference, you know, to from before and after as well, I think. Well, you see, I was um, 38 myself. I'm 47 now. But when I was 40, I had my womb taken out. So mm. I didn't realise I was going through the menopause until the last six months when girlfriends who are going through it themselves were talking and I was in those conversations around when they were having these conversations that they turned around to me and said, you're you're showing all the symptoms and that as well. So it's it's really refreshing and to hear that you've done a run for a charity because I've not heard anyone else and I didn't know there was a charity for menopause. So I'd like to say thank you to you as a woman who's going through it to help, you know, to raise awareness because it's, unless you hear Penny Lancaster or Davina McCall on the TV, mm. you don't hear Joe Blog, or like, you know, you and I. Joanne Blog. Mm. You know, Joanne <laughs> Blog, <laughs> you know, talk about the menopause, really. No, that's true. Yeah, I hope people will talk about it more and more. I sort of uh, set up a, a little bit of a get together at work. We've only actually had to, to get togethers, but, you know, just to to give women an opportunity to talk about it and also to encourage them to if to talk to their bosses and colleagues. And because the more that we can talk to not just talk to each other, but the more we can talk to men as well. And and, and get them on board the better just yeah. increasing the understanding and the overall compassion and you know oh that's why you you like you know you're you're feeling like that today or acting like that today you know it's just it's easier for everybody isn't it when you was doing this you know this run you know you know generally you know our moods go up and down and I'm not sure if you're someone that does have a lot of low days how did you cope with them on the run or did you find you didn't have as many because your endorphins were listed you know were lifted every day <laughs> yeah I don't I did have very very low days but I don't they were more because of what I was going through rather than well I thought they were more because of what I was going through so it's hard to differentiate to be honest so you know I had you know, I had days, there was one day in particular where um, my shoes were just so painful and my feet were so painful. It was, I'm going to say only here, 47K, but, you know, it, it shouldn't have taken as long as it did. But it was a hilly day. It was a hot day. My feet were killing me. I ended up bringing my husband with 16 kilometres left to set and, and, and crying down the phone. <laughs> because I, I remember him saying, so are you running right now? And I just started laughing and then I started crying. No, no, I'm hobbling because I was in so much pain. But in that moment, I just put, or in that day, I just put it down to the pain I was enduring and discomfort of what I was going through. You don't know how much of it could have been hormones affecting my mindset as well. But to to go back to the other point that you said, though, as well, I do think, yes, of course you are getting in endorphins, aren't you? Every single day when you do something like that, I was very lucky with the weather as well um so i had sunshine for probably 90 percent of the whole thing and so being outdoors and in the sun day after day i think probably it did make me feel very well how how was the um how was the camping side of things because um not only were you doing this incredible run you were um looking after yourself and camping at night as well i yeah i did camp i didn't camp for the whole thing i did a mixture of while camping, camping, hostels, and I stayed in B&Bs and where I could in the evenings, I was fighting off to them and asking for discounts or sometimes I even asked, can I camp in your garden and all sorts of things. So I did a whole mixture. <laughs> camping was lovely when I when, when I got to do camping because I, I, I kind of like being on my own and at one with nature and all that business. Um, so when I got the opportunity to camp, I loved it. It was never too cold or anything like that. So it was great. The only downside of the camping for me was that would generally be then I'd be eating camping food or eating some kind of cold food and I would notice that my energy levels were lower the next day because I hadn't eaten two courses in a pub basically so that would have, I would be affected by you know le less calories but but yeah I, I loved the camping and I would have liked to have done more but I found it difficult to find 
enough campsites on my route. Going back to mental health, yeah, health yeah. You've, I know you've just recently done the, the juggle. How has your mental health been since now you're not running every day? You've, you know, you've done this massive adventure and now all of a sudden it's back to normal life or has that not been the case yet? Have you still been on a high? No, do you know what? It's interesting. Everybody said to me, oh, you'll get the post-adventure blues. And I really did think I would. Uh, it hasn't hit yet, but I am starting to feel a bit, not not low as such, but I'm not as exhilarated as I was. But that was that's largely because the first week I was back, I was just incredibly tired. Uh, I went back to work straight away day one and um, I was just mentally tired, I think. And then, and then I caught a virus. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been poorly all week so um, I haven't been able to get back into exercise properly I went for a run today it's the second run since I've been home and it was short and slow so I'm not doing anywhere near the level of exercise I was and I feel I am missing it I am definitely missing it and I I won't go back to that level, but I would like to get back to still five or six days a week because that's who I am and that's what makes me happy. So doing this for a menopause charity and for Mind, the mental health charity, are you thinking of the next big run and um, towards these charities? I would love to, but um, not in the not in the near future. Unless there was something that I could do that took a week or something like that, because it took a lot of planning and a lot of understanding and compassion from other people for me to have seven weeks off work. And also, it you know, it had an impact on family life and my husband. And so, you know, for the next foreseeable future year or two or three, um, I wouldn't be doing any kind of long adventure. But I would love to do something like that when I retire, maybe. You've done ultra races in the past or, or triathlons in the past. Is that something you'd do again? I have done uh, I've done one half Ironman and I've done one ultra. Never done a marathon. <laughs> so Pardon? Everything. You've just gone straight okay. to ultras? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I skipped the marathon part. <laughs> to be honest with you, it's a completely different ball game though because marathon runners are typically road runners who are watching their pace. And, you know, you, if you run an ultra, unless you're at the front, you're probably modifying your pace and you're chatting to people occasionally and you're going to walk up the hills. So it's just a completely different thing to do. And I'm definitely more in the latter group. So that's just what I like to do. I would consider doing more ultras, actually. I had originally wanted to do an Ironman a couple of years back. It got cancelled because of the pandemic. But having been running, hiking, training for the last couple of years, I've done a lot less cycling. So at this point, I'm not sure whether I would do an Ironman or not. I'll have to think about it and how I feel going back out on the roads on my bike or does that make me nervous again? I'm not sure. It, it sounds like there's certainly more more races for you. I mean, very basic running question, but what, what is it that you, you love so much about running, particularly considering it's you know not something you were doing since your, your teenage years or your 20s? Oh, gosh, what do I not love about running? It's... It's like meditation, I think, you know, just completely, you might think about lots of different things and solve problems, or you might think about nothing and you're just listening to the birds and talking to the sheep as you go by, if you're mental like I am, and or I just sing to myself. Yeah, it's it's just so relaxing, incredibly relaxing. And if you're tired, you can just walk for a bit. I, I don't get, I never get hung, hung up about speed. You know, oh, if I feel like I want to run up this hill, I'll run up this hill. You know, I just think it should, it's there to be enjoyed and there's no pressure on it. And so, yeah, I love going out running. I love going out running with friends or my husband, but I also love and loved being out on my own when I, when I ran Jogal and doing my own navigation, finding my own way being lost finding my way back again <laughs> because it just feels like it's sort of good for your confidence and your sense of self or something if you were to speak to somebody who was perhaps themselves in their late 30s hadn't been running perhaps going through mental health issues or or, or perimenopause what, what would your advice to them be it can make you it just can make you feel you know really good and if they were unsure about whether they were 
um, fit enough to run, because you do hear that from people, then I would say, just go and walk and then jog a bit and then walk a bit and then jog a bit and just see how you feel. You could just do a mile if you wanted and go and have a cup of coffee. Just enjoy it. Put enjoyment first. And then before you know it, you know, you might find yourself doing 5K or even 10K and you can think, wow, I did that. And just accomplishing that plus being outside in the fresh air and um, in all weathers, all the endorphins and everything together is going to just make you feel so much better. Well, I have one more one more question. And uh, considering what you've just done and for the charities, hopefully it might be the most important one, but it's just to... Uh, give a bit of a shout out again to those charities and and let people know where they can go to uh, perhaps throw a few pounds uh, their way to to celebrate the fantastic achievement that you've done. Yes, thank you. So it's Mind for Mental Health and it is the menopause charity um, who are raising awareness and doing training for the menopause. And Both of them are pinned to the top of my um, Facebook page. Uh, So my Facebook page is called Lorna Runs Three Peaks Jogle, J-O-G-L-E. Fantastic. And what we'll do is we'll we'll put them in the uh, in the show notes for this uh, for this program as well. Lorna, thank you so much for joining us on the Running Tales podcast. Uh, Really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you, Lorna. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Me too. Nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us for another Running Tales podcast. We hope you enjoyed our chat with Lorna Cullen. Please do have a look at the show notes to see how you can sponsor her. Two amazing charities, the Menopause Charity and Mind the Mental Health Charity. Give generously if you can. If you enjoy what we do at Running Tales, I just want to bring your attention to a new project we have. We've started a website and a newsletter with Substack. You can find it at runningtales.substack.com. The aim is to tell even more of the extraordinary stories that we try to tell here on the podcast. Plus, we'll be looking at talking about some of the big issues around running, from the do's and don'ts of how to treat disabled athletes to getting tips to avoid injuries. As I said, it's all on Substack. You can see it on the website, runningtales.substack.com, or you can subscribe and have emails come directly into your inbox every time we publish something. Now, here's a slightly awkward bit. This does all take a lot of time, and we do need your support. There is a free subscription service, but our biggest and most in-depth articles will be behind a paywall, and we will be asking you to become a paid subscriber for just £5 a month, or for the reduced price of £50 across the year. We do really need your support to keep this all going. We appreciate things are tar- tight across the world at the moment, but if you can support us, we'll be really, really grateful. In the meantime, of course, the podcast will remain free to access on all your normal favourite platforms. So please keep listening. We'll be back again next week with another epic running tale. Thanks very much. Bye.